this way, the organism appears to the observing consciousness as a relation of two fixed moments in the form of immediate being, of an antithesis whose two sides on the one hand appear to be given to it in observation, and on the other hand, as regards their content, express the antithesis of the organic notion of end and actuality. But because the notion is such as a face therein, the antithesis is expressed in an obscure and superficial way, in which thought is sunk to the level of picture thinking. Thus we see the notion taken to mean roughly the inner, and actuality the outer, and their relation produces the law that the outer is the expression of the inner. In paragraph 262, Hegel is going to lead us to what we've got here as presented, a new law. Uh, the outer is the expression of the inner. Now, Hegel is not actually endorsing this law wholesale, as we're going to see as we go through the, the, this paragraph and the paragraphs yet to come, but he is putting that out there. You might say, well, why is, why is he doing that? Well, he is examining some of the key ideas of his own time that have to do with the observation of, of nature. And what we're looking at here is the observation not just of nature as such, but of organic nature. And as we're going to see as we go through the next couple paragraphs, um, not just all organic nature, but primarily animal organic nature, and ultimately you know, human organic nature in the next section. I don't often bring up other commentators on, on Hegel because I want to stick very closely with the text, but this is actually a, a passage where I think it's useful uh, in this respect to this passage of the ones yet to come to remind herself of something that Jean Hippolyte, the great French early translator of Hegel, he had to say about this, this section of observing reason in particular. And what, here's what he said in a nutshell, and I'm roughly paraphrasing. It may seem overly scrupulous, or as if we're, we're spending too much time on stuff that doesn't really matter to look closely at Hegel's text here, because what, what we're dealing with is a, you know, Hegel's own critical reaction to a science that none of us accept anymore as a, you know, an adequate science of nature. And he points out that, look, we're, we're not really interested in Hegel's critique of, you know, Schelling or, or, you know, other people at that time. What we're interested in is the core ideas. Do the, these show up, you might say, writ large, in any other way of observing organic nature that we can, we can find still around today? And I leave that to, to you the viewer to think about. So let's, let's turn to Hegel's text now. He talks about observing consciousness, and, and what we have in mind here is, of course, observing reason, observing uh, organic nature in terms of the organism. We've just spent the last several paragraphs unfolding what it is to be an organism. It involves having a sort of end in itself, the notion of end. And you notice that what we've got here is what's you know, being translated by Miller as an antithesis, a gay and zots, right? Um, and we've got a split that takes place here. So he says, the organism appears to the observing consciousness as a relation, not just breaking down into two things, but a, a relation. So there's a, there's a hole there of two fixed moments in the, in the form of immediate being. Uh, and he says this is an antithesis. Uh, whose sides on the one hand appear to be given to it in observation. So observing reason is supposedly observing both of these in observing the organism. And, and we're going to see that, again, played out in, in the next few paragraphs. So he says, um, the, the, this is the antithesis as respect to their content of the organic notion of end and actuality. Now, what we're going to see uh, very quickly is these two get replaced by some other important uh, determinations. But let's see what, what we have. So he says, um, the, since the notion is effaced, the antithesis is expressed in an obscure and superficial way 
in which thought has sunk to the level of picture thinking. So we have lost sight of the notion, the begriff, the concept, and instead we not only have you know sort of a image here, but we're engaged with images on, on both sides. So observing consciousness is not grasping it in a conceptual way, uh, in a full way, but in terms of the pictures that it's able to make for itself. And, and we just saw, just you know, a few paragraphs before, that this opposition is something that observing consciousness tailors to its own capacities. So he goes on and he says, we see the notion taken to mean, roughly, something else. The inner. Right? And actuality comes to be taken to be the outer. And the relation between them, which is the organism itself, ends up becoming something other than the organism, and ends up becoming the law. What law? This law. The outer is the expression of the inner. So now we've got something formulated that says, okay, this is how reason can actually understand what happens in an organism in terms of law once again. The outer is really, which is what we can observe more easily, the expression of the inner. Now we have to explore, well, what does that mean? And what implications would that have? And is it even true at all? When we consider more closely this inner with its opposite and their relation, we find that in the first place, the signs of the law no longer have the same import as in the case of previous laws, in which they appeared as self-subsistent things. Each is a particular body. Nor, in the second place, do we find that the universal is supposed to have its existence elsewhere, outside of the two sides. On the contrary, the organic being in its absolute undividedness is made the foundation as the content of inner and outer, and is the same for both. Consequently, the antithesis is still only a purely formal one, whose real sides have the same in itself for their essence. But at the same time, since inner and outer are opposite realities, and each is a distinct being for observation, they each seem to have observation to have a peculiar content of their own. However, this peculiar content, since it is the same substance or organic unity, can in fact only be a different form of that substance, of that unity. And this is implied by the observing consciousness when it says that the outer is merely the expression of the inner. We have seen in the notion of end the same determinations of the relation, that is, the indifferent independence of the different sides and their unity in that independence, a unity in which they vanish. So now in paragraph 263, we get to see Hegel beginning to explore what would this mean to have this, this law. Remember what a law is supposed to do is to provide us with the essence, the universal, the intelligibility of what it is that it is, is applying to. And remember too, laws are not supposed to have any sort of, uh, you might say, areas of inapplicability or exceptions. So the law says that the, the outer is the expression, the Ausdruck, of the inner. And with respect to what? This is the law that is going to pertain to organic being, to organisms, to those things that are indeed ends in themselves, that, that are self-producing and reproducing. Now, Hegel is going to call some of this into question, not the, the whole thing, but part of it here. And so let's look at what he, he has to say. He says, when we consider more closely this inner with its opposite, the outer, and the relation, the relation of expression, of externalization, we might say, we find that in the first place, the signs of the law no longer have the same import as in the case of previous laws. What, what does he mean there? Well, in the case of previous laws, what was supposed to be happening 
is there's a lot of individual cases or instances or matters to use the you know term that he used earlier in this section, materi, that the law then applies to. So you know think about um, the laws having to do with electricity. It has to do with static electricity. It has to do with lightning, which actually turns out to be static electricity in a certain way. Although Hegel didn't know that at the time, um, you know, also with what we might say the electricity involved in alternating current and DC current, all these empirical things that we can observe, they can be brought into one heading of a law, a general conception that has to do with, with electricity as, as a, a, a you know, force in, in nature, right? And that would be multiple instances. Here we're not talking about multiple instances because you don't get the outer and the inner separated from each other, except, say, perhaps, as Hegel said, in terms of picture thinking, Vorstellung. Where might you find that? Well, in a textbook, or in a Wikipedia article, or in a, um, you know, computer-generated uh, uh, game in which you could distinguish between the two things. You're separating things that aren't truly separate from each other, and Hegel points out that they, they both have the same foundation, this organic being, which is going to function as the universal that the law is looking for here. So he says, we don't find the universal is supposed to have its existence elsewhere outside of the two sides. With, with the previous understandings of law, you've got particulars, and then you've got the universal provided by the law. Here, somehow, the law is something that needs to be intrinsic to the organic being. Reason is supposed to be discovering this law because it's already actually there in the organic being, not because reason is simply pasting it or projecting it onto the world after it comes up with it in its study or its armchair <laughs> on its own, right? So he, he goes on and he says, on the contrary, this organic being and its absolute undividedness is made the foundation as the content of inner and outer and is the same for both. So the organic being is, is providing a foundation, it's providing what actually is there, and we're, we've got these two aspects of it, the inner and the outer. So observing reason wants to go after, as Hegel says, the content of both of these and understand that content, interestingly enough, in halt, right? So in a certain way more inner than outer, uh, but it wants the content of those. And it's not really able to have a grasp on them, as he says, a peculiar content of their own. Why not? Because each one of them reveals that what's really going on here, inner and outer, are both, as Hegel's going to say, forms. He's not saying gestalt there, it's not shapes, it's form, which is, you know, the, the counter, uh, uh, you might say, the, the counterposition or the uh, correlative to content. And so he goes on and he says, this peculiar content, since it's the same substance or organic unity, can in fact only be a different form of that substance, of that unity. And this is implied by the observing consciousness when it says that the outer is merely the expression of the inner. Not grasped as such, but implied. The outer is merely in, we might put it this way, uh, another form what is over here in a different form, but they're both forms of the same organic being. So now we're seeing the meaning of this law getting played out a bit more, and at the same time, it doesn't appear to be saying what we originally thought, and this law seems to be, as Hegel's putting, pointing out to us, rather different than other laws in, in, in important ways. So he says, we've seen in this notion of end the same determination of the relation, that is the indifferent independence of the two different sides and, and their unity in this independence, a unity in which they, they vanished. Hegel uses a term there that we've seen so many times. Um, how are we going to hold, this is a question to keep in mind, 
how are we going to hold inner and outer in view as we're making sense of them? We have now to see what shape the being of inner and outer each has. The inner as such must have an outer being and a shape, just as much as the outer as such, for it is an object, or is itself posited in the form of being, and as present for observation. Here in paragraph 265, we get one of those ever-arising Hegelian paradoxical statements which uh, arrest you and, and make you say, whoa, whoa, what is happening here? It's a very short paragraph, but in it Hegel is saying something that in a certain sense should throw us for a loop. It actually makes perfect sense when you unpack it, but when you first hear it, uh, like I said, it's a paradox. It, it strikes you as, that, that can't possibly be right. And um, what this shows us is, is Hegel working as a phenomenologist, as in certain respects, um, being more willing to follow reason where it will go, uh, you know, reason as, as consciousness, uh, than reason itself is. Um, and, and Hegel begins this by saying, you know, well, what shape, what gestalt, gestalt, you know, forms of consciousness, shapes of consciousness, does each of these take? Does the inner and the outer take? And now Hegel's not going to worry so much about the outer as such. We can observe the outer, right? That's the, the directly empirical, we might say. But now he's going to say something, at least at, on its face, paradoxical about the inner. He says the inner, which is the inner, right, must have an outer being and shape. Now, he doesn't say something like the outer. He says just as much as the outer. So this should raise some puzzles for you. Well, in what sense is it actually inner then? There's, there's a, a, you might say, a subjective intensity or a, a depth to the inner that the outer, uh, the, the oberflache, the superficial, doesn't uh, actually possess. Now, why does Hegel say that this is the case? He doesn't say, hey, here's my metaphysics, uh, I just happen to think that inner has outer as well, and, you know, it's better to have both at the same time or anything. He's not saying that. What he's saying in the rest after the ellipsis that I've got there is the following. He says, it is an object, or it is itself posited in the form of being and is present for, for observation, right? It's consciousness... As we're observing it ourselves, we're the observer observing observation, that is producing what we might call the outer inner of the, the inner itself. So let's dwell on this just a little bit, because this is, this is an important doctrine. It's something that commentators have called attention to, and I think it'll be useful since we're now working with these terms inner and outer. If something was purely interior, purely inner, how would we possibly know what it is? How would we possibly even grasp its presence or its absence, let alone its determinateness? Do we have, you know, uh, special senses that can just sort of peer into things the way, uh, you know, intuition, Anschauung was supposed to? Remember, Hegel doesn't, doesn't go for that. Other philosophers of his own time were, were doing things like that, um, sometimes in terms of grasping the absolute as such, sometimes in terms of you know, some, having something like a moral sense uh, that leads us a bit astray in our discussion, so I don't want to get too caught up with that, but that's an example of that. No, Hegel is, you know, people talk about him as being an idealist and you know, being captivated by his own ideas. Hegel is so empirical that he thinks that we, we have to really observe what's going on. He's like William James in that respect, more empirical than the empiricists themselves. So if observation is actually going to be able to make any sense of this contrast between inner and outer, 
the inner has to be present in some sort of outer that it's not merely an expression of, according to the law, but which is actually this, this inner. So we, we get to outers. So that's something to dwell on a little bit. Um, we're going to see this come up in, in other respects later on, but uh, that's probably enough about that, that point right now. The organic substance as inner is the simple unitary soul, the pure notion of end or the universal, which in its partition equally remains a universal fluidity and therefore appears in its being as the action or movement of the vanishing actuality. Whereas the outer opposed to that existent inner subsists in the quiescent being of the organism. The law as the relation of that inner to this outer thus expresses its content, once by setting forth universal moments or simple essentialities, and again by setting forth the actualized essentiality or shape. Those first simple organic properties, to call them such, are sensibility, irritability, and reproduction. These properties, at least the first two, seem indeed to refer not to the organism in general, <clears throat> but only to the animal organism. As a matter of fact, the vegetable organism expresses only the simple notion of the organism, which does not develop its moments. Consequently, in regard to those moments, so far as observation has to take account of them, we must confine ourselves to the organism which exhibits them in their developed existence. Paragraph 265 is going to continue Hegel's examination of this law that the outer is the expression of the inner, and it's going to bring us in the end to talking in terms of these three essentialities, he calls them, uh, or uh, properties, or, or you might say functions of the organism, which then in the next paragraphs to come, he is going to examine. And you might ask at this point, well, why those particular three? Here is where we're seeing Hegel responding to the, the you know, attempts at, at natural science of his own time, um, which were largely figuring things in terms of these, these three functions. Um, it's not as if these have been entirely abandoned as, as being you know, essential to, to organisms, but they're, they're conceptualized in, in different ways. And we don't need to get too hung up on, on that uh, at this point, or even in the paragraphs to come. So Hegel is going to say the organic substance can be understood in terms of the inner and the outer. And he begins the paragraph by talking about the inner. He says that uh, the organic substance as the inner, and remember we just had this, this previous paragraph where he's talking about the inner itself, the outer of the inner. Now he's talking in terms of the simple unitary soul, a conception that uh, many people in our own time have completely rejected, but you know, if you want to understand where Hegel's going, you, you have to sort of uh, put, that, put that aside for a moment and, and bracket your, your, your disbelief in the existence of a soul. This is a common idea that there is some sort of you know, unitary thing, doesn't necessarily have to be a you know, floaty, ghosty kind of thing, but there's something that is unitary, that is simple in a certain respect, uh, that, that binds the entire, you know, organic being together. Um, Aristotle called that a soul, a psuche, and Aristotle thought it was the form of the body. Um, here we're not even talking about, you know, a soul in a theological sense, but more in the sense of, you know, we might call it the unity of, of the living being. He also says that it's the, you know, we've talked about this, the pure notion of end, or the universal. So, no real problem there. We, we already understand, you know, what the pure notion of end is, because we've talked about that in paragraph after paragraph. Insofar as it's the outer, he says that it's the quiescent, which is a nice translation of ruhiga, uh, restful, you know, at rest, being, static, we might say, static being. So the inner is dynamic, the outer is, uh, as outer, uh, static, right? It's, it's, it's got its determinations, and it is what it is. So now here's where it gets more interesting, though. He says, the law, as the relation of the inner to the outer, right? What law? The, inner, the outer is the expression of the inner, right? So we've got this relation of expression there. The law, he says, is a relation 
between universal moments or simple essentialities uh, to which then become actualized essentiality or we are asking about this earlier, shape, gestalt. Gestalt can't be something purely inner or it's not going to be gestalt. It has to externalize itself. This is a key idea of Hegelian dialectics, that um, it's nice to have things that are inner and inwardness and, you know, uh, interiority and all that, but unless it externalizes itself, unless it appears in some way, um, it really doesn't matter. It's kind of a pragmatic criterion. Let's, let's, so let's go on. He says, the law expresses its content once by setting forth universal moments or simple essentialities, and again by setting forth the actualized essentiality or, or shape, those first simple organic properties to call them such are what? Sensibility, sensibilitet, irritability, and reproduction. Three key things that characterize living organisms. Hegel's going to say a little bit later more animals than plants. He thinks plants basically just reproduce themselves. But being able to sense an external world, to relate oneself, one's consciousness to externality, and then to be able to respond to it. Irritability doesn't just mean getting mad or, you know, being touchy. It means being able to respond in coherent ways to a changing environment. So he says these properties, at least the first two, seem indeed not to refer to the organism in general, but only to the animal organism, right? Okay, so plants, now we know that plants actually do, in certain respects, sense their environment. Um, you know, they can tell where water is, for example. They uh, respond to heat. They turn towards the sun if they're, if they're trying to catch that sunlight. Uh, so we might even say that they have some of that aspect of irritability, you know, especially when we get to things like, you know, Venus flytraps catching flies and all that sort of stuff as well. But he goes on and he says, um, in regard to those moments, so far as observation has to take account of them, we must confine ourselves to the organism which exhibits them and their developed existence. So now we're not going to look so much at, at organisms per se, at, at plants, for example. We're going to think about animal organisms, or you know, we might think of other things that, that have these characteristics that are central to living things. 